So now we are live. Uh, it's uh, our great pleasure and honor to have uh, Mrs. Amira Pass here with us. She's uh, a researcher at IBM and uh, a quantum machine learning researcher uh, in South Africa. So uh, without further ado, uh, here is uh, the great Amira Pass to, to, to give us uh, an introduction to quantum machine learning. Oh gosh, I don't know how, how great I am, but thank you for such a kind introduction and thank you for having me at this event. I'm, I feel very strongly about, you know, quantum education in, in Africa and so this is this makes me really happy to see. Um, yes, so I don't need to introduce myself, and uh, but I do have a lot of content that I want to get across to you guys today. Um, and if at any point anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask and uh, hopefully we can get through everything. And Karim, if I can ask you to just let me know when I have five minutes before the end so that I can just wrap up properly. Um, oh, sure. Okay. Brilliant. Okay, cool. So let's let's begin. Yes, yeah, so the idea here is to give you an introduction to quantum machine learning. And uh, while this is not uh, very deep, I hope that, you know, at least the high level concepts sink in. And then if you have any like deeper questions, we can discuss after that. Um, okay, but first I just want to remind you very quickly about um, classical machine learning, right? And so the whole objective of a normal machine learning task is that you usually have some, some model, and uh, we call this, we can call this some function f, and this model depends on some data and is parameterized. And the goal, of course, in a machine learning task is to like pick the parameters for whatever model you have so that your machine learning task becomes good, right? This model is robust. It gives you accurate pr predictions or, or something like this. It models the task accurately. And then quantum machine learning, of course, is just like trying to understand how or if there are any benefits in making any part of this model quantum. So um, perhaps outsourcing certain calculations to a quantum computer, do we get some speed ups? Or maybe a quantum computer gives us inherently different um, computation that we can make use of in a quantum space that gives us an advantage. And like, you know, um, Everybody, everybody knows that quantum machine learning is a super hard topic, right? I mean, this was mentioned as well just now. And all companies, I mean, I made this slide, I think maybe three years ago uh, of some companies that are looking at quantum machine learning. And now I'm confident that I can't even fit on a page um, all the companies that are looking at it. And I think um, there's a lot of hype around quantum machine learning. And um, I don't think all of this hype is totally justified. So, so some of it is. It is. A, it is a very exciting topic. It's. It's definitely a, a field that that needs to be researched thoroughly. But I think also a lot of people are are uh, have these misconceptions of what quantum machine learning can do, and they think it's quite a lot right now. But when in reality, it's it's actually not so. So, this is also something I want to highlight. And um, in general, when people talk about quantum machine learning, they always put up this picture, right? This is like the, the canonical graph that you'll see. And it basically just puts machine learning into these four paradigms where um, you can either have classical or quantum data that is processed on a classical or a quantum computer. So, for example, this block here is classical data on a classical computer, right? So this is all of classical machine learning that we already kind of know or have heard about. But then you can also have quantum data on a process by a classical computer, right? So maybe you have some quantum mechanical experiments that output some data, and then you process it with a neural network. You tweak um, the parameters of the experiment like that. And of course, you can have quantum data on a quantum computer. But when I speak about quantum machine learning, I will talk about classical data, which we, which we know, which we have, and how do we actually process it um, on a quantum computer. And I think most of the recent quantum machine learning studies fall into this block here. Okay, but then first, we just have to quickly remind ourselves of classical machine learning, right? And forgive me if you guys are familiar with classical machine learning already. This is just a very basic um, reminder of how these things work. And so I mentioned earlier that, like, you know, we, we have these um, these models that we use. But in classical machine learning, we have this um, this very broad assumption that there is some relationship between our data, some true relationship that exists between our data. We call this X and um, some outputs, right? So maybe your data are like pictures of cats and dogs, and the outputs are the labels of cats and dogs. And there is definitely some true relationship which um, which relates the, the input and the output data, which we can say is uh, G, a function G for now. But of course, we don't know what this function is in classical machine learning, right? And so we try to approximate it with some function, and this function will have some parameters. And so if we um, look at, for example, some of these functions, a linear model, right? Everybody is familiar with this. We have some coefficients 
uh, multiplied by our data and some uh, biases. And then if we take this a, a step further, and let's say we, we take this linear model and we pass it through something called an, an activation function. So this sigma here is, is, um, is very popular in classic machine learning. It's an activation function. What that means is it's a source of nonlinearity. So it's a nonlinear function. It makes our linear model a little bit more powerful. This is something called a perceptron model, which is like the basis for deep learning. And uh, I just draw a picture of an example of, of one of these nonlinear functions. I think this is the ReLU function. Um, and then if we repeat this, right, so we take this, this idea and we keep doing this. So we take this linear, this linear model, we apply our nonlinearity, and then we multiply it by another set of, of um, parameters and add another bias and squash that whole thing again, through an, pass that through another activation function, another nonlinearity. We end up with the mathematical formula for neural networks, feedforward neural networks. And that's really all neural networks are, right? There are these linear models that are stacked on top of each other with nonlinearities injected in between. And um, usually people you know, love to show this diagram. Um, I, I think everybody must be tired of it now, but I actually quite like it because it, it's, it's actually a mathematical formulation, right? It's a mathematical picture here where you have your data. And um, let's say again, it's like a picture. And you can take the pixels of the picture, these are just values, and like stretch them out into a very long vector, right? So this is your data that goes into a, a neural network model. And then you apply um, your weights. These are weights or, or coefficients or however you want to call them. These are the parameters that we optimize in the model. And this is just typically in a matrix. And we multiply a vector by a matrix. We pass it through the nonlinearity, the activation functions. And then we get these values in between, these, these hidden layer values. And you can do this as many times as you want until you eventually get an output, right? A prediction, a label, the thing that you want to, to actually use to give you information. <coughs> Excuse me. And, um, you know, neural networks are extremely, extremely successful in, in classical literature, right? They're everywhere. They're in, they're in practice now. They're in business. And I just put some examples of different architectures. Not so important, but... What is important, what, what is, um, I think, quite cool, and I think largely the reason why classical neural networks are so successful is because they satisfy something called the universal approximation theorem. What that means is that they can approximate almost any function, like any function, any relationship, any intricate relationship between inputs and outputs. Um, and why? That is, again, largely due to the fact that we inject these nonlinearities in between. We have these activation functions. And if you're interested in the explanation of this, I think this is a really cool video um, to check out. Michael Nielsen is actually one of the, um, he's a physicist, actually, and one of like the founders of uh, quantum computing. He's um, this textbook, quantum computing, quantum computation and quantum information. He's one of the authors of that book, and that's like the Bible of quantum computing. It's really cool. Um, and I can also make these slides available, so don't worry too much about taking down that link. Okay, and then one last thing I want to say about neural networks and classical machine learning models in general is that we know how to optimize them now. So um, this is actually really, really handy, right? Because what that means is we know how to, to train a model to pick the parameters that um, give us meaningful and robust predictions. So for example, how we do this is... Um, once we get our output of our model, right, so we pick some, some random parameters at first, we calculate what the prediction is, and then we pass it through something called a cost function. And this cost function essentially checks your model prediction, so we call that y hat, by the true prediction, the true label. Like, so in the case of cats and dogs, if this prediction is a dog, and it will check it against the true label, if that's cat, then this will give you a very high cost value because your prediction is wrong. And so you, you, so an example of a, a cost function, for example, is just like this mean square um, error. And so you typically want this cost function to be as low as possible, right? You want your predictions to be as close to the true labels as possible. So you want to minimize this function. And a very nice way to, to figure out how to minimize this function, to pick the parameters that minimize this function, is through gradient techniques. So by calculating the gradient of this cost function, with respect to your parameters, you can figure out how to pick your parameters uh, or how to move in parameter space, mathematically speaking, such that you minimize this cost function. So I'll give you a very simple picture or diagram of this, and then we'll move on to, to quantum machine learning. 
So let's just imagine that our cost function is something very trivial, right? It's like this thing here. We can easily see that the minimum is here, but let's say we don't know what the minimum is because in reality, these cost functions are very high dimensional. It's very difficult to minimize them. So let's say we initialize our parameters, our parameters for our model, let's say somewhere here, and we calculate the cost function and, and we can see that the cost is like quite high, right? And so now to use these gradient based techniques, what we do is we calculate the derivative of the cost function with respect to our parameters, and we end up with a gradient vector, right? And this gradient vector is, is something that looks like this. And to, to then change or tweak our parameters, what gradient descent does, this is an optimization algorithm, is it says, let's descend down the opposite direction of the gradient. So the opposite direction of the gradient is in this direction, right, in the red, red arrow. And the next time we choose our parameters, we'll choose them in this direction. So let's say the next set of parameters, theta 2, we initialize here. And we do exactly the same thing. We repeat this process over and over again, right, until we eventually converge to a minimum of the cost function and some optimal parameter set, which I call theta star here. OK, so this is just gradient descent. Um, it's one of the optimization algorithms used in classical machine learning. And I mention it here because it is something that we can also use in quantum machine learning. OK, so now we can go to quantum models. And um, so this, this distinction between quantum models is something that I, I like to think of in my head, right? So I assume everybody is, is familiar with, with this circuit notation here. But if not, I mean, please feel free to ask, ask questions. So in quantum models, I like to divide them into two different categories. The first is this idea of deterministic quantum models. What that means is you can create an algorithm or a model where when you measure your quantum system, you know with certainty, 100%, what the outcome is going to be. So it will give you um, a deterministic value. And the second notation here basically just means like, you know, you've got some input state. So this is a ket vector. You can think of it as just a vector. And um, then you apply some, some operations to this vector. And these operations are in the form of matrices. You can think of this as matrix multiplication acting on the vector. And then eventually we do some measurement of the system. Now, the second and I think a little bit more of the newer generation of quantum models are something called these variational quantum models. Right? And so if we look at the circuit diagram here, what we immediately see is that the output is no longer deterministic. It, in fact, it's, um, it's stochastic. And what we typically do is we repeat this experiment over and over to get statistics of the output, to get an expectation value of the output. And these variational models depend actually on some parameters. So the, op the operations that we apply in the circuit are parameterized. So they depend on actual on parameters that we can tweak and we can change and we can, we can play around with. And so some of these examples of these um, variational quantum models, I just put some, some uh, names of, of algorithms, which I'm sure you'll be familiar with, um, quantum neural networks, support vector machines, and so on. So, so really a large part of these quantum machine learning models um, fall into this category. And these variational quantum models are very nice because they actually um, are a little bit robust to noise. And as you all know, our quantum devices that we have today are very small, are very noisy. And so this is actually very nice that these variational algorithms can show a little bit of, um, of uh, resilience to this noise. Okay, and then now that the overview, I think um, in this picture is very nicely summarized. So this was, uh, I stole this slide from Maria Schultz. So Maria is, um, I would say one of the founders of quantum machine learning at the moment. Um, she is, I'm very lucky to have her as my, as my supervisor. And I think this, this page very nicely summarizes uh, quantum machine learning in a nutshell. So you will start very similarly in classical machine learning, but you start with data. The first step, is to figure out how to encode this data into a quantum state, right? How do you actually load this data onto your quantum computer so that you can use it? Once you do that, then the next step is to process the data on the quantum computer. So we apply some sort of model. And then the last step, of course, is to measure your quantum system. You apply some sort of measurement, and this will give you then some classical information, which you need to interpret as a label or a prediction. And this is, this is basically the idea, right? It's a very similar framework to, um, to a classical machine learning um, algorithm with an exception of the measurement. Okay, so if we had to go back to the circuit notation and this, this picture here, 
Um, recently, this, it's been very popular to try and understand this idea of quantum neural networks. Can we actually create a, a quantum version of a classical neural network, which I showed you earlier? And um, spoiler alert, I don't think we can create a, di a direct analogy, and, and I'll show you why. So let's say we've got some quantum system here, and uh, all the qubits, these are all qubits, right, are initialized, let's say, in the ground state, so they're all initialized to zero. So remember this the state here can be um, thought of as just a very long vector, right? a very long ket vector. And usually in quantum machine learning, in these quantum neural networks, the first step, of course, is then to figure out how to encode your data. right? So this ux over here is, um, is basically, you can think of it as a very, very large matrix or a tensor product of smaller matrices acting on individual qubits. And this matrix or this operation here, this unitary operator, it depends on your data. So X is your data. It depends on your data. What does that mean? It means that when you apply operations to these qubits, you often rotate them in different angles, right? And if these angles depend on the values of your data, then you are, in a sense, encoding your data information into the rotation values of these qubits of your system. So this is how you, you would... Um, encode the information that you have into a quantum model, into a quantum circuit. And I'll show you an example of that just now. The next step, like we mentioned, is um, to apply some sort of model, right? Some sort of process. So we can apply another set of operations. I just call them W, right? So another set of unitary operations. But this time, instead of the rotations or the operations, depending on your data, it can depend on some parameters. Let's say we call them like theta one, like a vector of parameters, right? So um, we can rotate the qubits or manipulate them about angles that depend on some parameters, which we can train and optimize. And so this is very similar to like a neural network, right? Because um, it, we have a, a data vector, usually in a neural network, and then we apply a weight matrix to that data vector. And that weight matrix is trained and optimized. And um, in this setting, we can kind of do the same. We can pick parameters for this these operations. And um, if we wanted to add another block, we could do that easily, right? And add some more parameters here that we train and optimize. But the difference between a classical neural network and a quantum model or quantum neural network is um, the dynamics are inherently linear. The, um, you know, the, as a function of quantum mechanics, everything that happens here has to be linear, right? Or else we violate some, some fundamental properties of physics. And so we can't inject these nonlinear functions in a, in a, in a qubit system, in, in this kind of model here. And this is really bad, right, one would think, because this nonlinearity gives us the power in classical machine learning to have these, these really great universal function approximator models, right? So um, there are some suggestions on how to inject these nonlinearities into these quantum models. I'll put up some papers after this. But I want to also point out that actually a source of nonlinearity in a quantum model can actually come from your measurement strategy. So your measurement introduces nonlinearities, and the reason is very clear in the mathematics. So um, if you're uncomfortable with this, with this diagram, just remember that this is a vector, these are matrices, and then the measurement is actually, you can think of it as like um, a vector and a vector transpose that like kind of squash a, a matrix in the middle. So if you if you pick up any quantum computing textbook and look at the formula of the measurement, you will immediately see why this is a nonlinear operation that happens. Okay, and then once you measure your system, then um, of course you get classical information. And the last step is to just figure out how to manipulate this classical information such that you have a prediction or a label for your machine learning task. And this is an overview of, of, um, of the framework of, of machine learning models, right? And um, this is also sometimes referred to as a variational classifier, so a quantum neural network or a variational classifier, because it's um, a variational model. It depends on parameters, and it does classification tasks typically. And how it's normally displayed is like this is just combined as one operation that depends on some parameters. And if this was a little bit fast or confusing, then I suggest um, we also did a very in-depth four-part ser four series lecture on explaining each of these blocks um, in a lecture each and uh, just digging a little bit into 
why we should choose certain data encoding strategies, certain variational models, and certain measurement strategies for a quantum machine learning task. So this is a link that um, that if you're interested, you can you can go check out. And here are some papers that I mentioned about um, other quantum neural networks that people try to to introduce to to create new things, more powerful models, um, inject nonlinearities into things and stuff like that. So if you're also interested. Um, some of these models or, or some of these papers are, I think, quite cool. And by the way, the, I just want to also highlight the, the field of quantum machine learning is, is so fast paced that, for example, this mod, this paper here came out, uh, training deep quantum neural networks in nature communications. And they argue that quantum neural networks are so, the, these ones that they propose are really good. They're really um, easy to train. They perform very well. But then I think maybe a month later, a paper came out that disproved all their claims because they showed that these models actually have a very bad loss landscape. So you often want to find, remember I mentioned this loss or this cost function, you want to find the minimum of this cost function. But um, if this cost function is very, very flat, it's very hard to find the minimum, right? Because it's just flat everywhere. And so it's really hard to train this model because the gradients don't give you any information anymore. This is something called a barren plateau problem. And this is something that's quite common in, in quantum machine learning, which you'll hear of. So this model actually falls into this barren plateau problem where the, the cost landscape becomes flat and you can't train it anymore. Okay, let's see how much time I have. Okay, good. I just want to take you um, a, very quickly through some of these subcomponents that I mentioned. So I glossed over them very quickly and um, didn't really show you how you would actually go about doing this, right? So let's look at the first step of encoding your data, the first block. So getting your, your information into a quantum circuit. So let's start off with a very trivial example. Let's say that we have um, a data point and this data point is just a two dimensional vector, right? So it's a vector with two entries. And one of the encoding strategies in quantum machine learning that's, that's often used is something called angle encoding. And uh, it's very intuitive how, how it works is depending on the structure of your data. So in this case, our data is two dimensional. Then you pick a number of qubits that's equal to the dimension of your data. So in this case, we would just need two qubits in our system to encode this data point. And how do we do that? We apply Hadamard gates to each of these qubits. So Hadamard gates are operations that you probably are familiar with that basically just put your qubits into superposition. So once these qubits are, into, are in superposition, we apply rotations to them. And in, in the case of angle, angle encoding, you apply, um, let's say, for example, Z rotation. So you rotate each qubit about the Z axis, and the angle at which you rotate them depends on your data. So the first qubit will rotate it about the Z axis, um, about an angle that's equal to the first value in our data point, the first feature value. And the second qubit will rotate it also around the z-axis, and this time the rotation will depend on the second feature value of the data point. So this is the idea of angle encoding, and the name is, is quite straightforward as well, right? You literally encode your data in angles um, of rotations for each qubit. And if we had a higher dimensional data point, for example, now we've, we've got you know, three entries here, then we simply add another qubit to the system and we do the same kind of rotation. This is obviously a very trivial way to do it. Um, and there are other ways to encode your, your information into, into quantum uh, states. But this is just something I wanted to show you as an example. All right, so now let's say, um, let's say we, we do angle encoding right, as our first step to get our data in. Then what models do we apply? What operations do we do here that depend on, on these parameters theta? And there is a lot, a lot, a lot of literature trying to figure out exactly this question. Um, and this is a very nice paper over here trying to understand how expressive certain models are that we can apply in that variational component, right? That component that depends on parameters. Um, so uh, there are lots of different combinations that have been tested and different rotations and different, different we call them ansatz. Ansatz are just a framework for a, a, a circuit, right? And um, so, if you have time, I encourage you to read this paper. It's It basically talks about certain operations that you can apply that allow your model to cover the full Hilbert space, to cover the full computational space of your qubit systems. So this is very nice. So one that I want to show you is uh, one that's actually quite hardware friendly. So if you're coding up some quantum models, you'll see this kind of um, 
variational model already pre-coded in Penny Lane, which you'll see later with Thomas, um, in Qiskit, which is IBM's quantum computing framework. So this is this is something called um, the real amplitudes model in the Qiskit framework, if you're interested. So how it looks is um, you apply some data encoding strategy, right, which we discussed. And then the variational part consists of rotations, again, on each qubit. So this time I just assume, let's say we've got four qubits in the model. And um, this time the rotations are about the y-axis. So this is a different axis, right? And this time the rotations depend on angles that are parameterized. So they're actually parameters in our model that we can tweak and we can change. So for example, the first qubit we rotated around the y-axis about an angle equal to theta one. And then this, this model, does a little bit something more, right? It does, it adds these entanglement blocks. So this is creating, these are C-naught gates, and this is creating entanglement between your, between your qubits. So these will hopefully introduce some non-classical correlations that somehow give us higher expressibility than perhaps a classical model would. And then we can add some more um, rotations and some more parameters in our model. And if we want to increase even more parameters in our model, we can repeat this block and as many times as we want. So this is an example of, um, of this kind of variational structure. And now the last block, the measurement. Now the measurement is, um, is a little bit tricky to understand, I think, in, in general. So I want, to, I, want to, um, I want to just show you the most common strategy that's used in classical machine learning, um, sorry, in quantum machine learning. And then if you are interested in, um, in understanding a little bit deeper why, then I would encourage you to, to read a little bit more of the literature. So what is typically done in quantum machine learning models is actually quite simple. Um, they ignore the other qubits and usually just measure one. We measure one qubit and we get statistics out of this qubit, right? So for example, um, let's say we measure this first qubit and this first qubit can either be in state zero or state one, right? But remember, this is not a deterministic model. So we have repeat this experiment over and over until we get some expectation values. We get some statistics of how likely is it to be in state zero and how likely is it to be in state one. So we'll get a probability distribution over this, over this qubit, over the possible states it can be in. And then we simply take this probability distribution and map it to a prediction, right? So let's say we get a probability distribution that gives us 70% of the time um, the qubit is in state one and 30% of the time it's in zero. Then we can say that um, the, prob the probability, it's more, it's more probable to, to belong to class one as opposed to class zero, right? We can convert these to classes. And maybe this means like that the picture is a cat and 70% uh, probability that the picture is a cat. Okay. But there are more sophisticated measurement strategies, which is again something I want to mention and, and point out. And um, there are theoretical reasons for, for why we do certain measurements and, and strategies. And I'll point you back to that lecture series I mentioned earlier, if you want to understand a little bit more why we do these things. Okay, so once we have um, the measurement of our system and we can convert it to a label, right? We've got a prediction now for our quantum machine learning model. And if we have a label or prediction, then we can plug it into a cost function. We can plug it into a cost function that will check it against the true outcome, the true label for the, for the data point. And so if we can do that, then we can start to use classical optimization techniques like gradient descent, which I mentioned earlier, which is really, really nice, right? Because we don't have to worry about reinventing the wheel and um, trying to figure out how to optimize these quantum circuits. We can already borrow from classical machine learning techniques and do things like gradient descent and these are already pre-coded very nicely in, in optimizers in, on quantum um, software frameworks like Qiskit, for example. So I put this snapshot of this um, piece of code here, but Penny Lane has it as well, of course, and, and many others. Okay, so if we go back then to this, um, this picture of uh, quantum machine learning, which I put up in the beginning, what we have done is we basically discussed each, each of these components, right? So we've got some data, which we can represent as a vector. We figure out how to encode this data. So I showed you one method um, that's simply encoding the vector values in angles um, in, the, in each qubit, rotating each qubit about angles that are equal to the data values. Then by processing, we apply this variational model. I showed you one example that consists of these RY rotations. These rotations are on the y-axis and these are parameterized. And then we have some entanglement between the qubits. 
And then I showed you a very simple measurement strategy to process that information classically into some sort of label class. We map that into a class. Um, ah, I forgot to put the link for the notebooks here. So if you're interested in, in coding up this, this kind of model, uh, there is already code that exists um, in Jupyter Notebooks, which you'll find in the lecture series that I linked to earlier. So it is in the earlier link, and I'll post these slides. So I'll share them with you guys. Um, something I just want to mention before I wrap up is there are tons of software frameworks that are really accessible for you to go and learn quantum machine learning. So Xanadu, Thomas will show you Penny Lane earlier. They have wonderful tutorials. Oh, he'll show you later, sorry. They have wonderful tutorials on, on quantum machine learning and um, how to actually like optimize a, a very uh, trivial model and then you can scale this up. It's it's very, very nice. Qiskit also has some quantum machine learning um, algorithms and classification algorithms that you can use. And there are also other frameworks that um, that are that are being explored and developed. So QSharp, for example, by Microsoft. And then I put this link to something called the um, QOSF, the Quantum Open Source Foundation. So this is a wonderful place to go and learn. Their GitHub page has a ton of resources on quantum computing, quantum machine learning. And they also have a mentorship program, which you can go and, and sign up to, to participate. Um, and you get to work with, with really talented like professors and, and people around the world in quantum computing on cool projects and um, produce stuff that's useful for the quantum community. So this is really nice and it's open at the moment for applications if you're interested. Okay, something I just also want to mention since I have a few minutes, I think, is um, there are actually, there is incremental progress. So, you know, you might be wondering, um, why should we go quantum? Have we shown any advantages yet? And the answer is no, we haven't. Um, we haven't tangibly showed that quantum machine learning is or will be better than classical machine learning. But there is incremental progress and research coming out that's indicating that quantum models are actually um, interesting and useful for, for various um, for various reasons. So, so one thing I want to make mention here is, is, is of this paper. And if you're interested, here is the archive link. And um, what is done is in this paper is um, we look at the effective dimension of a quantum model and a classical model. What is the effective dimension? The effective dimension tries to understand how powerful is your model that you have. It tries to understand how large your model is in a certain mathematical space. The bigger it is, the more powerful it is, the more uh, function it, functions it can express and approximate. And what was interesting, what we found is that quantum neural networks, so a quantum model of the structure I just showed you with a, a data encoding strategy, a variational model and a measurement, if you do a certain encoding strategy and a certain variational model, then your quantum neural network is extremely expressive. It's, it has a very high effective dimension when we compare this to feedforward classical neural networks. Again, the one I showed you in, in the beginning. These classical neural networks are make up the foundation of deep learning. And this is really interesting, right? Because um, if these quantum neural networks have this very, very high capacity, this very high expressive ability, then they should be able to capture or express more functions than already powerful classical neural networks. Um, of course, the next question is like, how do we use that information, right? How do we how do we know? How do we test this? Because our hardware right now is just so noisy. Um, and also, do these models train better? So we train these models on some small data sets. And um, what we saw was actually that the quantum neural network also trains the fastest. It trains to the lowest loss um, much faster than, than uh, a classical neural network. So this is also something very interesting. And uh, the last thing that we noted was that these, these particular quantum models can avoid these problems of barren plateaus, which I mentioned earlier, uh, where this, this loss landscape or this class landscape becomes extremely flat. This doesn't seem to happen uh, in these cases, but this is still active research, so we'll have to see. Okay, and then the last thing I want to point out to you before I stop talking is something a little bit more um, exciting. Um, it is the QHack event, which is coming up, coming up soon. And if you haven't uh, registered and you're interested, you can go to QHack.ai. This is something that Xanadu is hosting. And I think it will be really, really fun, really, really awesome. So they've got um, a series of talks, all quantum machine learning related for three days. Um, including tutorials, uh, hackathon afterwards, uh, lots of discussions will go on there. And um, if you're interested in quantum machine learning, I highly recommend it. So there, there will be all kinds of talks from, from very basic all the way to very advanced. And um, what's, 
what's uh, currently happening in, in quantum machine learning literature will be will be explored here. So this is something really cool, I think, um, to attend. OK, cool. And then with that, I am done. I know that that was very uh, probably very fast and a lot of uh, information to take in and digest. But if you have any questions, please, I'm happy to take them. Thank you so much for your presentation. It's wonderful and uh, and amazing. Actually, we have uh, three questions here. The first one uh, it says uh, that um, is loading classical data into quantum states remove or re does it actually remove the like a lot of potential speed up in, uh, in, in, in quantum machine learning compared to classical machine learning? Yeah, that's a very good question. So um, at the moment, yes, you're totally right. So loading data into, so there are different strategies, right? And um, depending mm -hmm. on the strategy, some are more efficient than others. And I would say that a large bottleneck is actually loading data into a quantum system. So this is definitely something that's time consuming, but it is something that is being worked on and um, will hopefully become more efficient in the, in the future. So I would say it is a bottleneck for now, especially when data when data scales and um, but there are some other schemes that are proposed to be more efficient but these will obviously require fault tolerant quantum computers so these quantum computers that are um, you know they are error corrected they don't have noise and we can use them properly so when this comes around then we should not have this problem anymore okay uh, another question uh, it's a bit more like a very broad one uh, it says, uh, for classical machine learning engineers, uh, what are the roles that uh, they can actually play for, for, for the quantum uh, for the quantum part? Or how can cl classical machine learning developers uh, get into uh, quantum machine learning? So I would actually say that it is, um, it is so, so nice if you come from a classical machine learning background to get into quantum machine learning because people who are in quantum machine learning right now are often physicists and they don't really know very well the classical machine learning side of things. So they try and like approach stuff from a quantum and physics perspective. And if you're from classical machine learning, this is really, really nice because you already have the mathematical foundation that you need to understand the quantum mechanics part, right? You have knowledge of linear algebra, you have knowledge of um, vector spaces, of matrix multiplication, of all these things that are, um, are used in quantum computing. So if you're a machine learning, a classical machine learning engineer, my first advice to you, by the way, I, I started like that, right? So I'm not a physicist. I I was um, originally in finance and then moved to classical machine learning and then found quantum machine learning. So my advice to you would be um, pick up a quantum computing book. The one that I started with was this one I mentioned earlier, Quantum Computation and Quantum Information by Nielsen and Schwang. You can Google, a, there's a PDF copy available online and read the first three chapters and you will see immediately what I mean by um, quantum objects are very, are very um, natural to understand in a quantum circuit if you have this machine learning background. Once you do that, then I would suggest going and actually playing with some code on, um, on Penny Lane, for example. So if you visit pennylane.ai, they have wonderful tutorials that you can follow. Everything is in Python, so it's very um, accessible. And then you can immediately see which parts are interesting, which parts you like. And there are tutorials on different sections of quantum machine learning there that you can also play around with and see like which algorithms you think are promising and dig a little bit deeper. I would not suggest reading papers at first because this might be off-putting because there's a lot of jargon that um, quantum machine learning practitioners throw out there that are not familiar. But you will know them, but you will know them by a different name. So I would suggest going uh, about the route of getting the quantum com computation knowledge first, and then going to um, do tutorials like on Penny Lane and stuff like this. Okay, uh, another one. Uh, it says that uh, like angle embedding is is performed after uh, initializing the state into into superposition. So uh, the uh, the the uh, it, it it says that yes. perhaps it may affect uh the quantum machine learning model itself and it may lower its accuracy so is is there a solution for this or it's uh, it's uh, it, it it only depends on the points of the data sets but, but perhaps that is what i understand from from the question itself um so if i'm also not sure i understand the question so well so but, I, um, I, yeah. I can read it like like as okay, it is. Sure. So it says that as angle encoding is performed on superposition, data tends to be encoded on a probabilistic algorithm. So 
it doesn't or does not increase uh, our features makes quantum machine learning model to be more effective. So uh, the accuracy will fall uh, and it will be lower than the classical machine learning model. So how can we like or how to, to solve this uh, problem? Okay. Uh, I see what you okay. Um, yeah, that's a very interesting question. So if I can maybe paraphrase it to see if I understand correctly. So I think what um, what the person is, is pointing out is that in the classical setting, you have your data that's encoded straight away, right? This is um, your, your actual data is being passed into the neural network, for example. But on the classical, I mean, on the quantum computer, you're encoding it in superposition. And so now things become a little bit uh, probabilistic and, and stochastic and random. And so one is wondering if this will decrease the, uh, the accuracy of the quantum model. And the answer is, I think we don't really know, right? It, it, it really depends because this probabilistic encoding could actually be helpful. It could be helpful because maybe resources like entanglement, like um, um, certain quantum operations, maybe give us, like I said, you know, more expressive models and um, maybe the data encoded in this probabilistic fashion is not actually um, so bad. So I think it really depends on the design of your quantum algorithm. And this is a really good question. I mean, it's very hard to say um, in general whether this would decrease the accuracy. I think it does make sense that you say that, of course, but I think there are instances where it might actually be beneficial. So. Yeah, it's a good uh, question. Uh, actually, I'd like to, uh, uh, I'm so sorry to sure. uh, intervene. No, sure. Uh, uh, th this question is interesting. It's not my question, but actually it raised some question in my head that actually Hadmard is itself is a rotation. So uh, uh, the question is if the encoding rotation may be lost in the Hadmard rotation. Uh, I think this is a question. So that's why yeah. maybe quantum mm. machine learning will not be uh, that accurate because maybe Hadmard rotation is stronger, has more effect than the, the rotation in the data itself. Sure, yeah, and this is totally valid, right? I mean, this is why I'll show you a little bit um, more slides. This is why there are other encoding strategies that are suggested. So another one, which I didn't I didn't have so much time to mention, is, um, is something called this higher order encoding. And this higher order encoding, so now imagine you've got a two-dimensional data point again. I just call the feature values x1, x2. This works a little bit differently. So yes, one may argue that the Hadamard is the dominant thing here, right? And, and these rotations are being lost. But in this encoding strategy, you apply entanglement and you repeat the, the rotation. And this time, you know, the angles are of a product of your data feature values. And you repeat this again. So you can repeat this multiple times and then your Hadamard is no longer the dominant uh, thing here in the in the model. So I showed you a very, I'd say like a very trivial encoding strategy, but this one, for example, is uh, far less trivial, right? And um, also depends a lot more on your data and this is repeated. And so the rotations that depend on your data here will start to dominate. And um, this is also something that's believed to be uh, classically difficult to simulate. So if you're interested in that, it's it's in this paper here. So maybe this, maybe this helps to, to clear things up. Or it might confuse you even more, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, no, no, there are other strategies. Good. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> good. Any more questions? Um, uh, I, I'm not sure if we are going to take questions from okay. the audience, from the attendee. Let me stop Please sharing. Stop yes, sure, I might. Um, uh, at all. Here we have, Cur I think we have two questions from Dr. Muhammad Zidane and uh, Ahmad Alam. Uh, so uh, there is this uh, question uh, in the chat. It says that in, in deep classical neural networks, uh, the nonlinearity between linear uh, between layers is necessary. Otherwise, you, you you could collapse all layers into one. So for for the quantum model, uh, the weights or the thetas are collapsed into a single unitary. So is there any use uh, to introduce nonlinearities between them through measurements in between uh, the weights itself, uh, or are these entangle, uh, entangling gates you showed? Uh, are just sufficient and perhaps I may uh, add something here um, I'm, sure. I'm more interested into the continuous variable uh, quantum computing and uh, the fog back end itself in for example like in, in the strawberry field so perhaps what do you think about using uh, curve gates or cubic phase gates or higher order Hamiltonians 
to, to introduce uh, effective uh, nonlinearities and also uh, regarding your uh, your latest paper uh, will it actually make uh, the fission information matrix like more expressive and it, it, it can show for example uh, like true quantum advantage over classical uh, neural networks so um, I think it, it's it's a it's a big question uh, yeah sure um, okay so let me let me start by by just ex answering the first part right so everything I showed you today is for um, finite dimensional qubit models right so um, the first person asked uh, about this the necessity of these nonlinearities and this is a totally valid question, and um, often the entanglement is not enough. So what, you know, I put up some of these papers of other quantum neural network architectures. Some of these people try to do clever things like applying something called mid-circuit measurements. So you can inject little nonlinearities by measuring in clever ways in different parts of your circuit. So you can measure portions of your, of your model and then use this information and this like kind of introduces these nonlinearities between um, your quantum circuits. So this is, these are, these are in some of the papers that are linked. So this is definitely something that, that people are trying to, to do to inject these nonlinearities in between. And this is important, right? Because this is where the model gets the power. Then when you go to infinite dimensional models, right? So this is what Karim is talking about now, these infinite dimensional Hilbert spaces. So you're no longer working with qubits, you're working with Q modes and these Q modes are infinite dimensional. You can do, different operations to them. You can squeeze them and apply displacement gates. And to be honest, I have no idea how this will affect the Fisher information. These nonlinearities will affect the Fisher information. So I think these infinite dimensional models offer us something very different, but also something very unique, right? Very The, the tasks that they are good at doing are um, for the moment not, um, are, are quite specific, I think, right? So like, for example, like Gaussian boson sampling and all this kind of stuff. Um, and I'm not sure how it would affect the Fisher information spectrum. This is a really interesting question, right? Um, and ideally, one wants to pick a Fisher information spectrum so that it ha it's, it's quite uniform, right? So you want your Fisher, Fisher information values to be quite large so that um, you're not in a barren plateau situation. And whether these nonlinearities do that, uh, to be honest, I don't know. Uh, it would have to be checked. It would be very cool to show that it does, and um, this would translate to a high effective dimension, a more powerful model. Yeah. Uh, you're on mute if you are talking to me. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I think uh, we can unmute uh, one of the speakers, uh, one of the entities right now. Just a second. Uh, I think uh, Dr. Mohammed Zidane may may speak right now. Um, can Can you unmute yourself uh, to ask your question? Can you please unmute yourself? Okay. Uh, Dr. Muhammad, then uh, I think you can speak now. Okay. Uh, are you hearing me? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you for Prof. Ahmed. Thank you for Inji Karim and uh, Ms. Amira. I am very interested for this talk. However, I would like to explain some point about uh, including that. Uh, indeed, including data from uh, classical data to quantum data may be done by many, many uh, uh, ways. One of them, you can raise, uh, raise, uh, uh, raise the, the representation, please. Sorry, I, I didn't hear the last part. Uh, are you hearing me, please? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, please show me the presentation about encoding the, the data from classical world to quantum world. Sorry, you'd like to see the representation of the, yeah, the slide. Yeah, oh, the slide. Encoding yeah. slide, I think. Ah, yes, sure. Okay. Uh, I one? think we have only one minute left before we we <laughs> should thank Ms. <laughs> Amira. I can see uh, I'll go to the next uh, session. Okay. So please do this quickly. Okay. Do you see the slide? Not yet. No? Oh, okay. Uh, hold on. Let me the one with the numbers. I'm not sure. I'm going, uh, the slide which uh, exhibit encoding the data. Yes. 
Okay, 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 ignore it, ignore it. Uh, okay. The point uh, which I, I need to explain is including the data from classical data to quantum data uh, can be done by many, many, many uh, ways. Uh, one of them, you can take the first uh, each point as alpha uh, after scaling and uh, uh, convert it using beta equal uh, radical one minus uh, alpha squared. Uh, so, uh, including the data could be done by many, many ways. Uh, and uh, I think, I think uh, Dr. Amira was just giving an example, uh, and uh, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. the only way to encode the data. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 This is the, the, the point. And uh, entangling uh, the gates uh, may not affect the, you can uh, convert the data first, then you can any operation. And including the, encoding the operation depends on, uh, in some models, in uh, the uh, the type of model itself. So uh, this is the point which may confuse many researchers. Uh, so this this point uh, which I need to uh, explain. Thank you, Ms. Amira. Thank you, Prof. Ahmed. Thank you, Angela. Thank, thank we, you. We, we should thank uh, uh, Dr. Amira very much for this uh, very wonderful talk. And as we expected, it is a hot topic, a hot talk. Uh, and we like we really thank you very much for uh, for this uh, uh, session. Sure, thank you so much for having me. And if anyone wants to chat further, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, yeah, you can. I can pass my contact details on. Expect many emails uh, <laughs> today. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Amir, we should ask the attendee to go to the attendee to go to the next session right now okay okay right now i will close uh i will stop the recording okay and uh